Good evening, beautiful people, and welcome to Let's Talk, Healthy Mind, Healing Art, a night celebrating artistic expression and conversation about mental health, brought to you by MCC Theatre and the Mental Health Coalition. At MCC Theatre, our mission is to provoke conversations that may have not have happened otherwise. These are times of social upheaval, a global health crisis and an economic crisis, which all exacerbate underlying inequities in our system. When we were invited to participate, to be a part of the Mental Health Coalition, we knew we had to be part of a dialogue. So a little bit about me. My name is Ian Field Stewart. I use she, her, they, them pronouns. I'm a performer, activist, MCC's talkback facilitator extraordinaire, and one of your moderators for this evening. So as I mentioned, tonight's event is a collaboration between MCC and the Mental Health Coalition. So tell us a little bit more about the coalition, please. Welcome. Dr. Tia Dole. How are you doing, darling? Oh my goodness, that is an amazing introduction. My name is <laughs> Tia Dole. Uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you, darling. Um, so yeah, uh, so Tia Dole, um, PhD, is the Chief Clinical Operations Officer at the Trevor Project, the world's largest organization for suicide prevention for LGBTQ plus youth. Dr. Dole oversees all of Trevor Projects' crisis services programs, as well as is the volunteer uh, as well as the volunteer community on Trevor Lifeline, Trevor Text, and Trevor Chat. So she is a licensed clinical psychologist and a longtime advocate for LGBTQ plus rights. One of her passions is normalizing mental health conditions within communities of color and helping people get access to services. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so again, my name is Tia Dole. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and I'm also here representing the Mental Health Coalition, which is a nonprofit organization comprised of an unprecedented group of the most passionate, influential nonprofit organizations, advocates, celebrities, and media organizations. So we've joined forces to address the stigma surrounding mental health. Um, this is the first collaborative effort of this scale um, in which people talk and care for mental health. Um, the Mental Health Coalition's mission is to build a diverse and like-minded community of people who will work together to destigmatize mental health conditions and changing the way people talk and care for their mental health. All right, so y'all got to call her Dr. Dole, but I'm going to call her Tia. So yeah. Tia and I will be leading you through this evening. We'll be sharing various art forms and engaging in discussion through Zoom. Um, I'm also going to be forming a little something, you know, because I'm wearing many hats. You know, I'm very multi-talented and all that. Um, so as we know, there are inherent technical challenges, and we ask that you be patient with us as we deal with any that may arise. Um, also, if you have found your way into a different uh, Zoom, uh, Zoom link account, please make sure that you are headed over to our Vimeo, where we should probably be having the big party. All right, that's all I'm going to say. Tia, go over to you. Great. Um, and we just want to say, we know that there are a lot of places where you can spend your evenings, and we appreciate you all joining us. And also for our audience on Facebook, please feel free to engage with each other through the chat. And thank you very much for our Zoom audience for being here as well. So we have gathered a group of artists here tonight whose artistic practice is a vehicle not only for self-expression, but also for advocacy, as well as a way to cope with all that life puts them through. Um, we, we will not only experience their work, but also engage them in discussion about their process, journey, and how they are doing as individuals in this moment in time. Mm -hmm. So we also have an esteemed group of panelists who will join us in dialogue with artists about practice, impact, and share their thoughts and concerns and inspirations. We'll meet them later on in the evening. However, we have a special treat starting for right now. The first performer we will welcome to the virtual stage is the artivist to my right. I think you're on my right. You're on my right. Yes. Ian, Phil, Ian <laughs> Phil Silver. So Stewart is a Black, queer, trans, feminine, New York-based storyteller working at the intersection of theater and activism. Their work and she are dedicated to interrupting exclusivity of luxury by making things like entertainment, nourishment, and self-care accessible to the most marginalized in their community. Ian, what will you be sharing with us tonight? 
So I will be sharing two pieces. Um, uh, one is one that I've done so many times that if anyone has seen me do it before, I'm sure you're sick of seeing it, but you're gonna see it again tonight. Um, it's a piece that I wrote called Here on Hallowed Ground. It, it, I wrote it in after the, um, the Pulse shooting a couple years ago and first performed it outside of Stonewall Inn. And so I'm gonna be bringing it back here tonight. And then I will be performing um, an excerpt from my uh, one person show that has yet to really get a life of its own, but uh, called On the Train to Nowhere in particular. And the piece is called, I Never Said I Would Offer You my truth in a suit and tie. Oh, I love that. I cannot wait. Go ahead and take it away. All right. So give me a quick second. I'm going to pull everything up to make sure. So. <clears throat> Here on hallowed ground where now we stand, a black trans woman picked up a brick and broke a glass ceiling that white gay men reassembled in their own stained glass image. I guess when you exist at the intersection of a black, queer, femme, and othered body, even stone walls can't protect you. Here on hallowed ground where now we stand, we have taken communion. Upon this holy ground, there upon this holy ground we have taken communion. Upon this holy ground, their blood has been spilt in the name of the father who never saw us, the son who was never freed from her cage and the spirit of giving that included us too late. We were pushed to the shadows and we found glory in our hole in the walls. They cut off our heads, leaving our torsos and an app in which to find love and we did. We found love in a hopeless place to the tune of a beat, even as fingers curled around triggers faster than tongues could curl around ours. Presente! But it gets better and love wins and gun control now because you couldn't then and you won't now see us as you step over our bodies on the way to Congress. My siblings, may we never forget that here on hallowed ground where now they stand, their names must always be said. Honors given must be earned. Liberation taken must be for all. And the spirit of giving must always include us. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know change gonna come, oh yes, it will. I never said I would offer my truth to you in a suit and tie. I offer my truth because the very way your eyes scrape the surface of my being has conditioned me for this struggle. Do not mistake resilience for acceptance. I never said I would offer my truth to you in soft tones. My truth is wild and exuberant. It attacks sensibilities and leaves even me exhausted. When I say, when I lay out the contents of my being piece by piece and you consume it without thought or enjoy it without provocation, be very clear that you are missing out. When I change my tone or make it easy for you to understand, you are missing out, not me. I have tasted my life in large bites. I have left pieces of my joy my rage, my grief, and my innovation smeared across the corners of my lips. I have dipped my fingers into the center of my journey and brought up diamonds. When I offer you my truth, do not send back the same thing I've seen time and time again. Give me wild, exuberant truth. Give me truth that stains the teeth and burns the eyes and cuts the lips and ravages the soul. Or just eat your gluten-free, fat-free, no calorie, no sodium wafer. Binge on the familiar and purge imagination. Leave no child behind and say it gets better and watch nothing change at all. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so those are pieces that I have done many times over the years. And as I said, I'm operating a mini, wearing, <clears throat> excuse me, wearing many hats tonight. So um, with that, I will switch roles, put the moderator hat back on. See, it doesn't look great. I look gorgeous. Thank you so much. I know that's what you're thinking. And we will continue with the performances by welcoming our next artist, Joel L. Daniels. First of all, I don't even know how I'm supposed to go after that. That was beautiful. Um, hi, I'm Joelle, uh, Joelle Leon. 
Um, I'm an artist, I'm a storyteller. Uh, born and raised in the Bronx, uh, home of hip hop, R&B, that's how I mean. Anyway, I have two pieces, um, two pieces I'm gonna share with y'all today. I'm grateful for the work um, that uh, Dr. Cole and the Charter Project are doing, MCC Theater is doing here um, in, in the great state and city of New York. So uh, this first piece I will be performing uh, is titled um, Emergency Exits. I don't want to be your lover. I don't want your mother to love me. I don't want to be your mistake. I don't want to be your easy. I don't want to be your rollover minutes. I don't want to be your secret. I don't want to be your arm candy. I don't want to be your emergency glass. I don't want to be your trigger. I don't want to be your crash dummy. I don't want to be your obstacle course. I don't want to be your suicide attempt. I don't want to be your suicide attempt. I don't want to be your suicide attempt. I don't want to be a pilgrimage to Mecca. I don't want to be your wholesome. I don't want to be your death by asphyxiation. I don't want to be your last resort. I don't want to be your savior. I don't want to be your daddy issues. I don't want to be your next best thing. I don't want to be your everything. I don't want to be your insert stereotype convenient for you and your boxes here. I don't want to be your pride and joy. I don't want to be your dream, nigga. I don't want to be your escape. I don't want to be your case study. You see, I am a whole human. I am complex. I am T minus and counting. I am a bomb and a handgun. I am fellatio in your living room. I am working on my credit score. I am, I masturbate because I don't want to cry today. I am my father's bad habits. I am light enough for the boardroom, but too light for your parents. I am only a high school diploma. I am therapy and I don't know the names of all the poets like I'm supposed to. I am every homeless man that looks like my father. I am too soft for hood bitches. I am well-spoken for a black man. I am my daughter's biological father, despite what the media portrays me to be. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, I am the problem and the solution. I am a slave to the pussy. I'm a wannabe. I am a buffalo soldier. I am a time machine. I am an Alabama abortion clinic. I am the first fire my father ever started. I am the last. I am Hendrix, hands folded. I want to be your beloved, you see. I am wanting to be your favorite color, your fuck fest, your overdue weekend, your miss quoted interview. I am Henny Straight. I am Hey Dick appointments. I am hearts dilated. I am all the codes in the matrix. I am a jagged little pill. I am a whole ass nigga. I am a whole ass nigga, a rape survivor, a man who says molested instead of rape because he is scared. I am sushi and gunshots in my hood. I am gang gang and a library card. I am bullets on my fire escape. I am open mouth surgery, the diaspora at the end of a dope needle, the last bars in ether, a crack house in a church hymn, a walking Napoleon complex, a Christopher Walken storyline, George Floyd's lungs, a Bible burning missionary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I am freedom. I am enough. I am love. Uh, so this is a new piece and it's a piece that I've been, I'm kind of working on as part of like my poetry collection, which is a, a essentially um, looking at how radical love shows itself in various ways from, uh, from a young, whatever, like a, a black man from the hood, basically. So that's that piece. Um, this piece is called um, Love as a Riot. It's a piece um, th that I wrote uh, following um, the, the protests in, in Minneapolis and written actually prior to um, when I, I don't even want to call it a riot, but, but, but when the act of protesting began. Um, and just so we're clear, because the, the act of riot tends to be placed on, on black and brown persons. You know, the Boston Tea Party was, I mean, essentially a riot. But that's another conversation for another day. I am wanting a riot, waiting rather. Bended knee, the broken glass beside the beignets, battered biscuits blown to bits, bitter and cold. We are outside protesting. The armory is shut down. There is too much shit on the freeway. We got bills, bills, bills. Bill Clinton on a sax, a cul-de-sac in a yard. He's smoking all the politicos, stepping on what used to be a now 
communicated gentrified farmers market feet feasting on figs fed up by the former grocer aisle next to birthday cards and receipts rip van winkles mixing with the feeler laces birds of paradise by howard and halsey we all got face masks on so we all looking guilty all looking shook crushed tomato paste under our feet play behind the beat play behind the beat play behind the beat they say still the bacon but for real this time gimme i can't feel my face concerto and b flat one time for the one time I heard my homie Elizabeth say we don't need the cannon, and I went, yeah, fuck the cannon. Fuck Confederate fan cannons, too. Nick Cannon, Cannon cameras, all the seas, cunts, computers, Congress. The cannon will not pay for diapers or file my income tax return. Did not, did not keep drive-bys away. Could not teach me how to jump, jump rope or play stickball. Could not get me into college or do my SATs or help me afford those expensive-ass classes that prepare you for sitting next to white kids and writing better English to impress their parents. It could not save me from being a trope, a fantasy, a fetishized fairy tale for white girls who smoke weed liberally in front of police stations like Anne. Could not show me how to bleed, how to crochet myself into rooms. The canon did not teach me how to tie my Tims. Could not tell me how to cut both arms to carry the revolution. Would not grant me permission to, to, to break rainbows for freedom. Could not sew my heritage together. Would not help me learn Steve Beichel's name, but a riot would. I am wanting a riot. I know the history, its trajectory, a mattress undone on a sidewalk, befriending the neighborly chalk, wanting the noise, jostling our ears for attention, filling the air grenade smoke, smothered hibiscus and lavender, the bonfires ablaze. We are judging each other's poor. Slumdog Olympics in our living room. Every day, my auntie's hands smell like chicken grease, like plastic seat sofa cover, no matter how much money she rubs on them. We all make bad decisions with cholesterol and testosterone with chicharrones and tostones. Glass houses and thrown stones is not just in the Bible. Don't forget where you come from, nigga. The calamity will make you bitter. Clam up around police, around news briefings, policies about keep away, keep away. Some of y'all been crossing streets when you see us, been using Moses to part ways with us. We ain't no better though, cause we stole the TV, some gas. We made hoagies out of the rent checks. Skip class, skilled in long dick and division. And I mean, for all of that, where were the fireworks? What happened to the Sandman, right? And, and rubbing the log, where is the smoking gun, the scalding hot tea? The least they could do was give us a DNA test, a quick, you are not the father, a celebratory Popeye's chicken sandwich between a BET mid-roll for NBA young boy, NFL, don't shoot, it's only a wallet, CBA, MBA, DSLs, all the acronyms for jump high, brother, keep it wet, die young, they say, tell us the diaspora is dying, they say, for drowning for a side B of the melodramatic minstrel show, which is a free stream of the lunch lady forgot to wear her hair net again today. So we are saying skip the general souls, the shredded beef, nothing will ever be as was. Shit, we can't cough around each other anymore. Still always the same, still not safe for us. I'm Joel Leon, you can find me at, at Sign J O E L A K A N A G E X. Come on, Joel. Come on, Joel. Listen, I'm giving you a celebratory Popeye sandwich right now, boo. I got you. I'm throwing them at I you. You better you. say it. You I'm better you. say <laughs> it. Listen, I can't listen. They can't clap for you, but I'm I gotta so I gotta celebrate you here. I gotta celebrate you where Can we, we at, that, boo. So we go. Let's 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 just let's do, do it, boo. It. Yes. <laughs> yes. I live. All right. So listen. Um, so first of all, I'm apologize because I said, you know, I said I said a fellow black person's name wrong, and that just cannot be. So we're gonna get the Joel right, period. Joel like Noel, I got you. <laughs> divinity, divinity. Also, what are your what are your pronouns, my siblings? Yes, oh yeah, yeah. He 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 him and his. Thank you. Thank you. All right, my yes. brother, I got you. I got you. All right. So first of all, I have a question for you, which is yes. that, you know, you are a writer and a storyteller. You have led talks about mental health and co-parenting and your website is called My Daughter May Have. How much of a challenge or a necessity is it to speak on and create works that are so personal? 
um, it's, 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 it's vital, I think. And I think, especially when we talk about this moment now, you know, like when I generally, when I walk into rooms, whether it be all white rooms, all black rooms, it's like I tell stories to black people. Um, that's never going to change. That's the goal. And, and, and I think part of that is leaning into my experience as, as, as one who identifies as a black man in this world and what that means and what that looks like and recognizing the more I can be vulnerable and, and lean into who I am as an individual, whether that be as a father, as a man, as a human being, as, a, as an artist, uh, um, as a lover, as a fuck up, the more I can do that and be honest about that and transparent about that, I, 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 what I hope is it makes it easier for others to kind of show up and do the same for themselves. So we're less judgy and more empathetic towards like, what's the work that we're doing to dismantle these systems so that brothers, sisters, non-binary folks, trans black men, women, whomever, like however you identify, we get to show up as ourselves without having to worry about the preconditioned notions that we, we, we've been told we're, we're supposed to show up as. Well, that flow was fire. That flow was fire, bro. Thank loved you. it. Loved Thank it. Thank you. Um, and the last question I want to ask you is, you know, what is it? What is the particular flavor that you have that comes from the Boogie Down Bronx? <laughs> Let's talk about it because every time, every time someone say they from the Bronx, it's just a certain kind of flavor. So I want to know what kind. What does that mean? What's your kind of flavor that you got from the Bronx? I, I think you know, if, if, if for me, it's it's uh, it's a it's a lovable honesty. You know, like I, I think you know when I when I look at my when I look at my mom, you know, like I'm West Indian, and so you know my mom came came well, into the states, came right to the now. states from Dominica when she was like 20, you know, and so raised three black boys in the, in in the crack era 80s Reaganomics, and so for me growing up in the BX, there was like an honor of tradition, but also of like this very, I learned how to be radically honest, I think, with myself, mm. which is what's forced me to kind of through all the trials and tribulations, like the Bronx groomed me to do that. Because if you couldn't, if you couldn't keep it like real, like I feel like we've made keep it real into like this kind of cute euphemism, but it really, it's about how are you standing on your ground and your own too in support of yourself. But also I think as an extension of your community and the Bronx taught me that I think more than anything else. I love it. Well, thank you so much for sharing your brilliance with us thank tonight. You. I'm gonna read your bio right after this, um, but I wanna know, is there anything that people need to know? Where can they follow you? What's the cash up? What's the memo? You know, we <laughs> gotta get the this coin. We ain't, we ain't gonna get that stimulus check, so we gotta get these coins. Let's, you know, what, where, where can the people reach you? I love you so much. I, um, I love you. It's uh, Joel, J-O-E-L, A-K-A, M-A-G. That's on Instagram, that's on Twitter. Um, the links to everything is gonna right be in my down. bio. Um, I have books for sale. I'm working on an essay collection. Um, so I guess be on the look. I feel, I feel like a rapper, like, so be on the look. I know, for that. you know, you, you know, know like, I, mean? I, got, I got my new EP coming out. You know <laughs> yeah, what you're like, that's what I'm like, like, yo, be on the lookout. My yo, be on the lookout. I got you. I got you. Yes, yes. So much. period. But, period, but yeah. though. Support, period. support. Period. Love it. But, but right, yeah, find you. me on Twitter and social. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Read this fire. It's about to be fire as you are. All right. Thank you. All right. Mwah. All right, so y'all, listen, here's the bio. Y'all ready for this? Here it go. So Joelle L. Da Joelle L. Daniels, known as Joelle Leon, is a performer, author, and storyteller who writes and tells stories for Black people. Born and raised in the Boogie Down Bronx, Joelle specializes in moderating and leading conversations surrounding race, masculinity, mental health, creativity, and the performing arts, with love at the center of his work and purpose. He is the author of Books About Things I Will Tell My Daughter and God's Words Do Rags Too. So listen. Book about things I will tell my daughter. God wears do rags too. Y'all need to go Google that, find that book, buy it, purchase, support some local artists. All right. Now I'm I'm done being I'm done being messy. So I'm gonna welcome our next artist who joins us all the way from the West Coast. Alex, what's good with you? Hey. hey. All right, so hey there. So um I'm gonna read your bio really quickly in front of you and it's gonna be a little awkward, but we gonna you just gonna like do a little dance, you know, show the people what you got. All right. So Alex Dolan is the author of The Euthanist and The Empress of Tempera. Tempera, is that I say it right? Tempera, but very close. Tempera, you know what? Y'all help me with these words now. Both published by Diversion Books. He also hosts the show Thrill Seekers, part of the Authors on the Air Global Radio Network, which reaches more than 3.5 million listeners. I'm gonna say that again, 3.5 million listeners. His short fiction is featured in the anthology, The Swamp Killers, Down and About Books. And he is the creator of the audio drama, The Patron Saint of Suicides, produced in partnership with, Audi um, oh, say that name for me, Audio Home? Audio. Audio. 
Adiome. Ooh, okay, fancy with Adiome Media. Adiome Media. All right. So tell us about how your most recent project intersects with mental health and your artistry. Yeah. Um, uh, first, I, I mean, Ian, it's really great to meet you. Joel, to meet you too. you're still on the, on the call. Um, there's a line that you had, nothing will ever be as it was that I've been thinking about a lot over the last couple months. Um, it's really great to be with you guys. Um, yeah, the, uh, so I, I was a musician and, and am a writer and so I've been focusing on book stuff and I just kind of fell in love with the, with the podcast audio drama space. Mm. And what a lot of the books that I've been working on were psychological thrillers. And it mainly because that's stuff I like. And I also feel like fiction's a good way to tackle issues that we're scared of. So mm. things like mental health, sometimes it's, it's easier to have the conversation when it's fictionalized. So I intentionally wanted to create this, this audio drama that, that is the patron saint of suicides that would um, be, create kind of a safe space for people to have that conversation um, inside of what is a crime drama. Um, mm. And so it follows a main character uh, named Haven Otomo. And later when you hear me read her, you have to picture a 28 year old woman, but she uh, is somebody who it, is recovering from, um, from trauma. Cause a lot of this shows about how, how we cope with trauma, how we cope with mental health. Um, and part yeah. of the, how she copes is that she's a stand up comic and she you'll hear me lapse into her routines, but she also goes on the golden gate bridge every night and tries to talk people out of jumping. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's a very complex character. Um, it, it's sort of this combination of light and dark uh, and this fluidity of like who we are as people where we can deal with mental health and we can also deal with these moments of, of joy. And uh, hopefully it'll be, uh, it's a great, the guys who developed an audio, like it sounds great. It sounds like a movie. There are 40 actors that are fantastic that are round out the cast. So when you hear it, it's, um, it'll kind of like sound like a movie. Love it. And uh, the last thing I want to ask you, which is just like listening to what you're saying, because you said so much that was so um, beautiful. But what really stuck out to me was like, um, a, like kind of, I, I'm going to have to paraphrase here, but essentially like, you know, uh, that psychological thrillers are a way to talk about what we're afraid of. And so as you feel comfortable, I'm wondering like, you know, what are some of the things that you're afraid of that you get to explore in your art, that your art kind of creates this avenue for you to explore? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is a way for me to lean into things like mental health. Uh, the first book I, I wrote about uh, death with dignity and euthanasia, and that mm -hmm. was a chance for us to me to kind of explore end of life decisions that we have. But um, I think part of what resonated to me a lot, I'm gonna hop back to Joelle's performance and part of what really resonated me with Joelle's performance was this concept of we're at this pivotal point right now where everything that we know is changing. And, I, and I'm hoping that things like mental health, um, the culture of race and um, inequality, the culture of, of oppression, all of that we're at a, at a level where we can start to talk about these things because it's so, there's so much going on. The situation is so dire that we can jump into it. And I, I'm hoping yeah. that there's uh, an opportunity for that. But to, to answer your question, um, like in this one, it's, it's mental health. It's um, uh, a lot of it is just seeing inequality and, and trying to have a voice and balancing that out. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much for that. So I think that uh, we're going to transition into uh, a trailer that you have to share with us, correct? Uh, and this is for this is for uh, this is happening right now. And then we'll hear from you directly, right? Awesome. Yes. It's so much easier to dwell on the masks, shoes, masks, trains, guns, bodies. So much easier to be afraid of those. Then everything turned to chaos. Bullets ripped through the train car. They burst through glass, steel, and us. Someone is coming to kill me. Haven Atomo. I need help. Please help me. The detective held his hand just above the mass of pulped flesh. When the train decelerated enough, 
his body slid off the front car and into the gravel alongside of the rails. Barely looks human. What are you looking for? I've been thinking about the cases, and there's something I can't figure out. I wanted to get advice from the Golden Gate Angel. Who the hell is that? It's the nickname the cops gave you for saving 34 people from jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge. Just because you carry a gun doesn't mean you want to use it or that you wouldn't feel devastated if you did. It's the second time we found a body near one of your murals. It sounds like you don't think these are suicides, Detective. Two men who both have the same kind of discipline to wait there and let the train plow into them? It seems unlikely. <laughs> Atonement makes us human, makes us strong, and gives us hope. Saint of Suicides. All right. Um, so, sorry, Ian, I thought you were coming back, but uh, all right. So uh, thanks everyone for joining us. And um, I am going to read from a scene. So again, this is uh, an audio drama called The Patron Saint of Suicides. And it's about a main character who is coping with uh, coming through trauma and her own mental health. And she survived a, tr a shooting on a train in Oakland, California two years ago. And the scene that we're, uh, I'm gonna read is in her voice, but she's basically attending a therapy group for survivors. And it's her thinking about the, how people are processing this and how people are going into that second anniversary. We're sitting in the living room at Lynn's house. The walls are lined with books and potted palms stand by the drawn blinds. Lynn owns one of these porcelain Maneki Neko cats, which are supposed to bring good luck, but which I associate with the happy ending massage parlors in Chinatown. We all sit in a circle of folding chairs, looking like a poker game without the cards and table. We're close to the anniversary. March 25th is a few days away. It hasn't even been two years, but around this time last year, a few folks had breakdowns, lots of tears. Outside the group, I talked to a lot of people through their panic attacks. Diego called me a lot back then, and he's been the one texting me the most this week. Clementa already sobbed in last week's session, and she's on the brink of tears now. Everyone's on edge. History is repeating. Diego tried to hug me tonight. I'm not a hugger by nature, especially not with Diego. I'm touchy about being touched. I even joke about it on stage. I have intimacy issues. I was dating a guy who liked to FaceTime with me, and he'd end the calls by kissing his screen. Way too intimate for me. I know it might sound strange, but I can't kiss my phone screen. Think about it. I take my cell phone into the bathroom. I swipe my screen when I'm on the toilet. If I put my lips on my phone screen, I would die of sepsis in like two minutes. Diego was always the most vocal last year, and he's the one who speaks up now. I'm afraid of trains. Is anyone else having this problem? He keeps bringing this up. We're all afraid of trains. I mean, Christ, I moved to San Francisco just to avoid trains because in the East Bay, Oakland, Berkeley, all the way from Richmond to Hayward, you can hear trains all day and all night. The moaning of freight horns, the grinding of Amtrak passenger cars, and the singular banshee shriek of the BART cars. Last year, when Diego brought up the train thing, I thought it was insightful. And it struck me that I might have developed a phobia myself. The more I read up on it, the more I realized the trains were keeping me up. Therapy only helps so much. Drugs only help so much. When my lease came up, I moved to San Francisco. So when Diego brings up trains for the umpteenth time, I stifle a sigh. If Lynn had her way, we'd be talking about people we've lost. And I'm sick of talking about the people I've lost. I've lost a lot of them. Krish, Dad, Milo, We've been together so long, we all know the people we've lost. No sense in marinating in our grief. I thought the whole point of this thing was to feel better. I don't want to cry tonight. 
That's the end of the scene. Woo! Woo! Thank you so much, Alex. That's a, probably a weird reaction to come in like clapping so hard <laughs> after that. But also, like, great work. Thank you for sharing with us, and thank you for um, your transparency and your artistry. Thank you. Thank you so much, love. All right, I would like to welcome up our next guest who is visual artist, Miguel Colon. Um, Miguel was born in the South Bronx and holds a BFA in painting with honorable mention from the School of Visual Arts. Miguel is a 2001 recipient of the Edwin Austin Abbey Mural Workshop Grant at the National Academy of Design. He is currently working on his first public work, a mural which ad advocates social justice. Welcome, Miguel. Thank you, Ian. Appreciate it. Um, of course. And uh, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks for having me here and taking interest in my work. Uh, it's truly a blessing. I'm grateful for this. Um, it's my pleasure. Um, that, um, it's funny. I sorry. You want to say? No, oh, no, no. You say something, baby. What you got? Oh no, no. I was just. Uh, I realized I haven't updated my bio on my website, and uh, that mural was uh, was already put up. It was. Uh, something that was, um, I forgot, it was called 14 by 48. And mm -hmm. it was, um, those billboard signs, it's called 14 by mm -hmm. 48 billboard. And they do billboard signs around the city. And uh, it was one of those things that um, the Fountain House helped me with because I met somebody at Fountain House who was a peer specialist. Uh, and peer specialists are people who have had mental illness with them. Uh, learn to work with other people with mental illness. And since they're coming from a place of having been there, you know, you can sort of trust them more. And also, um, I think it's helpful when, you know, when you do service, it helps you too. You know? But it was somebody, it was my friend who told me about it, Betty. And uh, I, I never thought I would get it, you know. And I was like, oh, I don't have a chance of doing this. And she really kind of, she told me about it. She pushed me to do it. And, you know, and it ended up happening, so uh, it's pretty amazing. It was my first public work. <laughs> I love it. That sounds incredible. That sounds amazing. I really, I wish I could see it. And so you would, you kind of, you kind of mentioned this already, but you are indeed a resident artist at the Fountain mm. House Gallery and Studio. Um, mm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Fountain House and how long you've been a resident and artist there? Uh, I think I've been at Fountain House for about two and a half, three years. Um, and um, I found out about it when I was in the hospital. I was having issues with uh, substance abuse and mental illness, um, and somebody was talking about it. And I thought they were meaning that it was a program because, you know, in the hospital, one of the things you, you start thinking about um, when they're going to release, when they're going to, um, you know, have you. Uh, segue out of the, the hospital is uh, aftercare. So I was thinking about like a day program or something like that. And I said, uh, oh, is Fountain House a, a day program? And they said, no, it's a, like a social club for people with mental illness. And that sounded so much more, it sounded awesome actually, because I've been in day programs before, you know, and they, and you know, I hate to say it, but a lot of them are kind of, they feel like that ends, you know? Um, and Fountain House is really a lot different than that. I've made a lot of good friends. I'm friends with a lot of the staff there, you know, who call themselves workers. And, and, um, and sort of shortly after I, I arrived there, I was kind of sitting around drawing in my unit, the wellness unit, and I just mentioned, well, oh, I sure would love to be able to make a living with my artwork. And uh, somebody told me, well, you should meet um, Lori Barenhouse, who is, uh, is, is also another artist from Fountain House. And I said, you should meet her because she's a great artist and she's doing really well to art. Maybe she could help you. So one day I saw her in my unit, and so I introduced myself to her. And you know that she took me right over to the studio, which was in Long Island City. So we got on the train and she took me over there. I didn't have any money because I, I was still didn't have much money at that point. So she gave me a, a metro card um, and I saw the studio and they gave me canvas and paints and a place to paint and sit down and work. And so it was, it was wonderful. 
That is such a beautiful story. And thank you so much for sharing it. And I know that that's just gonna inform uh, what we're about to see, which is some of your artwork. Um, and so I'm just wondering, you know, as we take a look at your paintings, you know, please like, can you tell us a little bit about the title and about the inspiration behind the creation of the work? Sure. Um, so yeah, I think this one's coming up, this first one. Oh my gosh. Oh, so beautiful. <laughs> you talk, you talk, you talk. I get well, to admire. This is a painting that I sort of kind of worked on for a long time, or you could say I didn't work on it for a long time. I, uh, I worked on it and then I, I came back to it years later to work on it. And fortunately, I still had the photographic reference. This was a young lady from the neighborhood where I lived in, in the Bronx, um, in Fordham Ward area. Her name was Dion. And um, I kind of knew her from the neighborhood. We were friends. and. Um, I thought she had a very interesting look, you know? And so I asked her to pose for me. And so she was in this pose and I wanted to take a picture so that I could have something to work on when she wasn't around. And for a second there, she just sort of turned her head to the side like this, you know? And I just felt that there was this kind of emotional content there that I really liked, you know, this kind of, a, you know, vulnerability yet, She's very much in control. And uh, so I'm really glad that I was able to, uh, to capture that. And, mm. yeah, yeah, like I said, I, I came back to it years later. It's beautiful. And there's something really beautiful about yeah. like the face as well, that it, it reminds me of like portraits I've seen in like classical Renaissance paintings and there's these fabulous portraits, but it has this contemporary feel to it as well. And so it's just so beautiful. Um, oh, wow. What's the next one you have to share with us? I'm so excited. Well, this is called uh, Heaven and Hell in the Bronx, D-A. <laughs> uh, come on, come it's on. Kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of a play on, you know, I love the way Spike Lee titles his movies, you know, like do the right thing and, and the way he, yeah, yeah. you know, kind of change words around to, to be almost kind of like the way words are spoken on the street, you know? Um, yeah. And uh, this was something, I took a course at the National Academy of Design called uh, the Edwin Austin Abney uh, Mural Foundation Workshop. And um, we studied with people like uh, Richard Haas and Dean Hartung, mm -hmm. um, who, uh, Richard Haas was a muralist who did a lot of work in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, a lot of really interesting Trump and Roy stuff on the sides of buildings where he would employ the architecture of the building and then he would take other architecture like ancient Egyptian architecture and stuff like that and put that in there too uh, or ancient Roman architecture and, uh, and then it just had this feel like it was really popping so in a sense it's kind of like what I was playing with here um, originally this was a small maquette when I took the class and what I did was I built like a little a small scale building I don't have it anymore I destroyed it because of my mental illness and my addiction, I was in a bad place, and I, and I uh, but fortunately, I still had the image of it. Um, but originally, it was a building, and the building, you could see that there was this architecture, like like you can see on the side there, those yellow buildings and the cornices and stuff, uh, uh, sort of uh, came out of the actual architecture of uh, the building. So I was trying to just trying to get a play on that. And so, so this is just, thank you, thank you so much. This is kind of a, a juxtaposition. Um, and it's really kind of about um, kind of ideas about stereotype. You know? yeah. The bottom in a way is kind of how people in the inner city are viewed about you know, the movies and, and the media. And uh, the top is also how, how you know, kind of, kind of viewed. And uh, the idea is kind of, it's about good and evil, and it's about yeah. perceptions. And, um, it's a stunning work of art. And I love that, I especially even drawn to like the, the, um, the basketball goal as a pillar that's so gorgeous. Um, what's the next piece you have for us? Thank you. Oh my gosh. Uh, this one I, I just completed recently. It took me a while to finish this one. And it's actually in the um, Fountain House 20th anniversary exhibition. Um, and this I started actually uh, about three months before, you know, uh, 
what happened with George Floyd and then how the Black Lives Matter protests started again. And, uh, you know, I feel like this is just something that's been going on. And I talk about this a lot in my work. And so originally, you know, I just kind of was playing with this as a juxtaposition. And it's, it's really kind of about this sense of the overuse, the abuse of power. Um, mm. And how if we don't check ourselves, you know, we can sort of destroy ourselves by destroying other people too, you know. Yeah. And, and as you can see, this kind of this juxtaposition of just these, these kids are just playing in the street in the neighborhood. And then you have police here um, kind of ready for just storm in, you know. And I, I just want to point out that I'm not saying the cops are bad people, police are bad people. I think that there's a lot of really good police and have a really hard job. But it's just that everybody has to make a decision for themselves, you know, like um, what's right and wrong. And I feel like I'm choking up as I'm saying that because it's like, it's 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 in all of us, you know, um, so. Um, mm. I so appreciate you sharing your viewpoint and sharing your art. Your art is so beautiful and I, love the way you are celebrating um, and honoring and archiving black and brown bodies in such glorious ways. It's such important work that we be remembered and archived and given flowers while we're still here. And so I'm so grateful for you for doing that. And um, thank you so much for sharing your artistry and your story with us. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you, my love. Oh, these are so gorgeous. So <laughs> as we're sort of, um, as we're sort of moving out, that I'm gonna welcome Tia back. Hello, Tia. and. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm going to hand it over to you for a moment. Thank you so much, Miguel. You're thank welcome. you, Miguel. Thank you. Those, were, those images were incredible. And Ian, I, I just oh, want to so say much. for a second, you are a light of, you are a sunlight right now. <laughs> Everything that oh, you were you. saying and doing, you're doing such a wonderful job. So I just had to say that. So I want to say, say thank you to all the artists who have shared a piece of themselves tonight. Um, and also my co-host um, who started <laughs> their performance and the singing piece was my favorite part. Um, so this has been such a special night because we're taking talking about the intersection between artistic practice and mental health. So before we come back to our artists, I actually wanna take a moment to get to know our panelists. So first I want to welcome Chris Bullard. I hope I'm saying that correctly, uh, founder of Sound Mind. Did I say it correctly? That was correct, yeah. Okay, great. So Chris is a former touring musician um, who has performed with acts such as Willie Nelson, Chris Christofferson. Uh, he later uh, was the, was on the startup teams of multiple clean tech businesses, right? So sub subsequently worked as a portfolio man manager at Acumen, a global nonprofit impact investing fund. Whew, that was a lot. Prior to founding SoundMind, Chris also founded a music support program for those affected by mental illness and with the National uh, Alliance on Mental Illness in New York City. Thank you for uh, for joining us. I'm going to also introduce Isabel Shanahan, which I also hope is correct. Let me see if they pop in there. There you go. Great. Um, Isabel is a graduate of NYU's master's program in drama therapy, um, is a licensed, th licensed as a uh, your LCAT, what does that yeah, stand for? Like arts therapist. Okay, okay great. I, that, I thought that's what it was. It holds a national registration for drama therapists. Isabel's background is in acting, theater making, and creative community development. Isabel believes super strongly in the power of healing through creative expression and its power to help cross cultural and personal barriers uh, towards a deeper. <laughs> So she works with the New York Creative Arts Therapy Group as serving diverse populations in New York City and the Hudson Valley. Welcome. Thank Finally, you. we get to see Ian again. Um, we were introduced to Ian as an artist and activist. <laughs> oh, we lost we lost you for a second. I think we're Tia. We have encountered Zoom issues. Sound. Sound. Wait, wait, no, we can't hear you. So, fun times. I don't think you, Tia, can you hear us? Can you hear us? We can't hear you. 
Um, my AirPods decided. You're to, back. My AirPods decided to connect. My apologies. <laughs> this is what happens. So I'm <laughs> We're going to have folks um, uh, talk a little bit about their work, and I was hoping Isabel, you could kick us off. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so, I'm, I'm just so sorry. I'm so sorry, but real quickly. Yeah. Real quickly, can we talk a little bit about the Okra Project? Is that all oh, right? Oh, you all didn't we... even hear that part. No. I can go back. You didn't hear any of it. We got to start so with the sorry. Beginning. Fair, fair, I got to show up for Black trans people. I can't oh, let us I, not I, get I, a I, moment. I thought you saw my, I was like all excited about it too. Okay, so the Okra <laughs> Project is a collective that seeks to address the global crisis faced by Black trans folks by bringing home cooked, healthy, and culturally specific meals and resources to Black trans people wherever they can be reached. That's why I snapped my fingers. And then, and then I went straight to Isabel. Tell me a little bit about your work. Uh, thank you so much, Tia. Um, so yes, so I work with the New York Creative Arts Therapists. Uh, we are a multimodal creative arts therapy practice. Um, that means we are drama therapists, art therapists, music therapists, um, and dance therapists, and expressive arts therapists um, serving New York City and also the Hudson Valley. Um, so our mission is to is specifically to bring both therapy, but specifically the creative arts therapies um, to all New Yorkers. Um, and that our primary way of doing that is by reducing barriers to financial access. Um, typically I think some people, you know, think about going to an art therapist as maybe something that um, is perhaps a more privileged type of therapy. Um, so we, we do everything in our power to um, make make our therapy accessible um, to all New Yorkers and beyond now that we have Zoom capacity. Um, we also contract with a variety of organizations around New York City, um, including uh, Harlem Children's Zone, Life is Precious, um, Innocence Project, and others working with both the staff to help reduce burnout by the use of creative arts therapies, and also uh, with the clientele that they work with specifically. Great. So, um, Chris, do you mind telling us a little bit about your organization? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and thanks for having me. Uh, so Sound Mind, our mission is really to end the stigma around mental health and mental illness all through the power of music. So working with musicians who have a personal connection with the cause and lived experience that they want to be vocal about and producing concerts and advocacy campaigns that both elevate their personal story as well as connect people with educational resources on mental health from other organizations that have support groups, programs, crisis text lines um, for that community that's being talked about. And so we started here in New York doing live events uh, and have since the COVID-19 crisis been moving into a digital platform. So doing live virtual fest or live to virtual festivals um, online, uh, working with podcasts to highlight musicians and their stories. And then most recently, um, just given how much is going on in the workplace around people struggling going back to work, we've actually started to bring musicians to talk about mental health in corporate workplaces and virtual events much like this, um, just to really talk about mental health through the empathy building that happens through music and the arts. Great, and Ian? Well, do you mind talking a little bit about the Okra Project? Absolutely. So the Okra Project, um, as you said, is a collective that seeks to address the global crisis of violence that Black trans people face all over the world and wherever we can reach them. Our original founding uh, was on the principle of hiring Black trans chefs to go into the homes of Black trans people and cook healthy, home-cooked, and culturally specific meals for them or in community centers if they're currently experiencing homelessness. Um, since COVID-19, we have had to pause our direct services, although we are hoping to bring them back in August um, and are working to figure out how to do that in a safe way. Um, but uh, on May 31st, we released the Nina Pop and Tony McDade Mental Health Recovery Funds, which set Black trans people up with one-time 100% free mental health therapy with Black therapists as a means of addressing um, you know, the uprisings that we are experiencing, the necessary social shift that is occurring, and also the continued murders of Black trans women and people. One of the things I was actually curious about asking the, the three of you before we invite our artists to come back is one thing I've been hearing a lot about is destigmatization of mental health conditions. And I was curious, 
what does that mean to you all? And what do you think needs to be done either in the artistic community or, or in the nonprofit worlds where you, some of you are residing? What does that mean? And I'm, I'm kicking this to everybody and I'm curious to know what y'all think. Cause I know it's a bit of a, it's a, it's a tough question. I'll just, I'm happy to start. I mean, for me, um, so I live with bipolar disorder and I've faced that stigma firsthand. And I even came from a family where it was pretty you know, open in terms of talking about most issues, but a lot of it was around education of like, what does that even mean to live with bipolar disorder and actually knowing what it is versus what you see in the movies and knowing that everyone is different. Um, and just the fact that a third of people still feel like they're going to be judged for seeking mental health treatment. We've come so far in a society in so many issues and obviously have a ways to go in many other issues, but mental health, luckily we've been talking a lot, a lot more since the pandemic. And, you know, I hope we can be in a world where that number goes down to zero people feeling judged for making, seeking mental health treatment. And it's looked at just like physical health. Like I'm going to go get my leg checked out. I'm going to go see a therapist or a psychiatrist. Thank you. Isabella, it looked like you want to talk. You're on mute. I would absolutely um, agree with, with what Chris was saying. I also think that um, just the use of language is so important. And the more that we infuse uh, the language of mental health and therapy, and even just talking about trauma within um, uh, our communities at large, on, online, um, in media, I think that is it, making a huge um, shift toward destigmatization. Um, I think artists have an incredible role in um, in assisting with sort of using their platforms to just sort of normalize the word therapy, the idea of therapy, um, the way that we talk about substance use disorder rather than you know drug addiction, um, the way that I even hear about trauma, you know, in 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 rap and in other pop songs, um, which which I think is pretty new to sort of use those those words directly. So. I think there's an incredible power in me and just using the words that we're that we're talking about and um, using them very widely and freely. Yeah, I think um, what I'll add to that is sort of I think that when we talk about um, specifically, uh, for example, black trans people who are existing at the margin who are pushed to the margins of our society. And while black trans people are the most resourceful people on this planet, we have made everything out of nothing. Um, I think that it is necessary to name that in a society that deems your existence to be either um, worthy of eradication, the fact that black trans women are consistently murdered, just this week two black trans women were, uh, two, two black trans people were murdered. And um, it is considered that we, like it's not worthy of talking about. It's not worthy of doing anything about. This has been going on for so long. And um, I, I think that it's necessary to name that we like black trans people specifically are not the voiceless. We are the people who are not heard. Um, we have been talking about our issues for so long and there is a cultural gaslighting of black people on the whole that we talk about that when we name our experiences, when we name and claim ourselves, we are told either what who you are does not exist. You are an abomination, you are wrong. There's something wrong with you. And so I think that when we talk about the stigma um, that stigma great, is greatly exacerbated when we talk about like what it means to exist at the intersections of race, class, gender, right? And we also make we also treat mental health therapy, even though we talk, you know, go to therapy, go to therapy, go to therapy, and we and we um, have also sort of created this in reaction to this like you know, these healthy conversations about like going to therapy, we've also created this sense of judgment that if you aren't going to therapy, there's something wrong with you. When we aren't creating the kind of inroads that are necessary to make therapy available to the people who need it the most. And typically those who are like, if you are white, cisgender, heterosexual, if you are just white at all, you tend to have easier access to the kind of resources and capital that you need to go to therapy, to treat your mental health. And so it's necessary for organizations like, you know, like mine, like for the girls, like Black Trans Femmes in the Arts, like Black Trans Travel Fund, to address the real lived experiences of Black trans people wherever we are, whether it be getting a car safely home, whether it be providing us with free therapy, free meals. We need to be addressing the real world circumstances that we live in because we can't kind of feel our way through um, change. We have, we, we need to like hold space for ourselves and our emotions and our feelings and all that we hold. And we also need to re realize that we do not live in a system that allows Black trans 
trans people to exist, much less have feelings about their existence. I really appreciate what you're saying, Ian, and, and it's sort of triggered in me a thought around, so I'm a clinical psychologist, um, and, you know, one of the things I noticed is sort of the level of, um, uh, not ignorance in a mean way, but sort of the, the way that clinicians, for instance, don't really know how to address systemic racism in their with their clients. And I was actually curious, thinking about, Ian, what you're saying, because it feels like there's an uprising, whether or not both Isabel and Chris have your organizations pivoted a little bit um, to address what's been happening over the summer, um, you know, with with COVID, with, um, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter and sort of there's to me, there's been a bit of a wa an awakening. How are how are the two of you addressing that addressing that awakening in your organization? Yeah, I can speak for for sound mind. We've definitely tried to address it as I mean, we're a diverse organization, but predominantly white. And to be able to speak, you know, specifically to the black community, for us, it's really about elevating voices who can speak to that dialogue. Um, so for example, yesterday, we had an Instagram live session where we had two black males, uh, one, uh, one queer talking about what it's like to deal with mental health issues as a black male and all that comes along with it. Um, and for us, it's really been about elevating those voices who can speak from that perspective, um, both to a black and white audience to be able to just get that dialogue out there and try to elevate it as much as possible in the most authentic way possible coming from the voices that can speak from experience. Um, yeah, it's a really great and important question um, without definitely without a sort of an arrival point, um, which I think is is what we are continuing to work on as an organization. Um, our, our company was founded by two white women. Um, and so one thing that our company has been doing through our, our staff meetings is really taking a look at and us all as staff as, as a as a um, diverse but primarily white um, company. Um, we're looking at the tenet, how the tenets of white supremacy play out within the organization, uh, organizational structure, and are working to continually dismantle those um, in a variety of ways. One is um, to um, reduce sort of the, the power differential within the organization um, by including stakeholders, our clients, um, into important conversations that uh, might be pairing a clinician with, um, a, for example, pairing right now what we're doing is we're pairing a clinician with one of our moms who's a, a mother, a black mother of two black children. Um, and she actually and I will be leading, uh, co-leading a group together to, to talk about parenting in, in the time of, of this sort of social reckoning and also COVID and, you know, they're pretty, they're inextricable, of course, but um, so sort of offering more opportunities for um, our clients to be involved in a leadership way, uh, if they so choose and, and having sort of appropriate compensation for that. Um, also, uh, really folk taking a hard look at the, our, our hiring practices of clinicians and prioritizing um, clinicians of color um, clinicians, uh, you know, LGBTQ plus clinicians, um, and continuing to uh, outsource to people who are doing this work professionally um, to help our company uh, really take a hard look and do some some overhauls where we have um, blind spots happening. So that's that that's sort of work that we have sort of been doing sort of casually, but now there's there's an intense focus to um, commit resources and, and, and time to that in a way that's uh, definitely ramped up. That's such a great point. And, and actually, uh, I, pre I think it sort of links to what Ian was saying about um, actually no voices no longer being silenced. Um, and I think it's a really important to highlight other voices that have actually previously been ignored. And I think it's actually a really great time to invite our artists to join us, Miguel, Alex, and Joelle. Do y'all mind jumping into the conversation? Because I have a couple of, of um, topics for discussion. 
And I, I think all of us are struggling with the lighting currently because we are transitioning from night to day. So, um, Miguel, do you mind turning on your camera if you can? Um, but so I actually had a question for everybody and I, and I don't necessarily like to direct to specific people. I like folks to be able to just jump in uh, free will. But Joelle, you actually inspired one of my first question for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the reason why is I was thinking when you were when you were um, uh, presenting or performing, um, I was thinking about the concept of vulnerability and especially as a person of color coming from the Boogie Down Bronx and what a risk vulnerability is for you or for all of us. And so I was actually curious if folks on, you know, either the artists and Ian, of course, with your multiple hats um, or the other folks, our panelists, can you talk a little bit about how vulnerability is threaded through your work? Because I'm asking about it. This is sort of the key to releasing trauma in a lot of ways. Well, I'll start by saying, I think, and, and, and thank you, Dr. Dole, for that. I, um, for me, yeah, Tia, Tia, call me Tia. Okay, I just <laughs> thank you, thank you, Tia. Um, I, I think part of part of the work for me too is kind of the, it's been easy for me to lean into my vulnerability when, the more I understood my privilege, right? Like when we talk about the complexities of growing up in a black man in the Bronx, it, it, it never really occurred to me like how much privilege I have as opposed to let's say like and Ian who may have grown up in the Bronx in a similar fashion, like I'm, I'm a black man. So how do I how do I reframe that? And how do I lean into, again, like my vulnerable spaces so that everyone can feel the freedom of being that way, um, but recognizing that I'm also in a space where I can do that in a more easier, more socially acceptable manner. Um, but for me, what I started realizing is like when I left the Bronx, you know, like I, I'm not gonna, I'm not the person who traveled the world, but like even just traveling the country and, and having the experience of being amongst different cultures, different people, it allowed me to recognize the more I leaned into myself and the harder it was, the more people were responding to it. And just as an artist, it, it I mean, there's a slight amount of ego attached to that, but I think for me, it was being able to see, oh, the more I'm just like myself, because I think it, it's not, it's very easy to make it a, a masculine or feminine energy thing where it's like, it's a human thing, it's a human experience. And so the more I'm realizing I can just be that person, be exactly who I am, like all my faults, flaws, mistakes, loves, fuck ups, and like be okay with that. It felt like it was opening the door for others to explore them, not just in their art, but also in their daily lives, which was really important for me. That's such a beautiful thing that you said. I, uh, Ian, I see your face. You want to jump in? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that the, the word vulnerable, especially for Black folks, is such a double, like, is such a double-edged sword because I feel that, like, there is um, a necessity, um, there's a necessity to recognize that that Black people um, on the whole, and particularly as, you know, you find yourself at many different intersections within Blackness, right? Black people are made vulnerable by the very, by the institutionalized systems that exist to um, keep us, to keep us oppressed, whether that be the police, whether that be, you know, living in a militarized police state, whether that be living, um, living um, within, within poverty, living within homelessness, right? Um, and so there is a necessity to recognizing how, um, how those various institutions make people vulnerable and um, force vulnerability on communities and what that vulnerability, how that vulnerability is abused. But I think that overall, there's also this other side of it that we don't often get to talk about, which is the beauty of the fact that what does it look like for us to be vulnerable to each other, right? And this is the conversation, right, that needs to happen and needs to be made, space needs to be made for Black folks on the whole to, to feel, to remove the, the fear that we have of that vulnerability when we face the world. Because the reality is that when we walk outside and walk in the streets, for many of us, it is life or death. And so I'm never gonna tell a black person like, you know, don't like, don't, don't fight that when your life is on the line. But I also think that there is a necessity for us to recognize that while we are here, while we are, uh, while we are with each other, we can, we need to, we need to begin to do the work that is necessary to open ourselves up and make ourselves vulnerable to each other. And how can we make our, how can we, um, through that vulnerability, find our truths, find each other's truths and find growth through and community through that. Because the reality is, is that there is a vulnerability to naming and claiming yourself, but there is also innovation, revelation, and nirvana when we walk into public space and say, this is who I am, and this is what I am not ashamed of, and this is what I find joy in. And so I think that it's, it's the balance of that, is how do we make space for um, the, the dangers of our vulnerabilities within society and the necessity of our vulnerability between each other. 
you know, there was something that you said at the beginning of, of what you were, when you started speaking, which is sort of talking about the difference between forced vulnerability, vulnerability forced on you versus revealing yourself and how that has like an internal versus external locus of control. And Joel is talking about revealing himself and feeling safe being himself. And, and I think one of the things when you're, when you're speaking about black trans folks is how they are targeted, right? And the vulnerability is forced on them. So I think that, that was such a, a really wonderful way to phrase it. And I actually wanted to ask Isabella a question in terms of this vulnerability, because as a clinician, as a clinician here, I think clinicians are often taught not to show vulnerability. And part of the reason why I don't like people calling me Dr. Dole is that it actually creates a divide between me and the people I'm trying to help. It creates a power differential and I don't need that to be helpful to other people. Do you think that um, that clinicians, people working in the clinical space um, need to work on their own vulnerability? Absolutely. Um, I think that, well, I don't think, I, I, you know, therapy is, is was kind of invented a modern therapy that we're using is was invented by white men right and so there's this idea of sort of like the blank slate and the guy that sits behind the couch and and sort of never reveals himself the man behind the curtain um and so there is i'm sure tia of course you're familiar with this idea of self-locating in therapy it's um as a clinician how do we close that gap especially of power right um, by locating ourselves as clinicians. So if I am meeting with a client, right, typically, you know, the way I was trained is, you know, thou shall not reveal thyself, you know, in any way, no self-disclosure is, 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 is a no-no and this and that. And over time, and especially, you know, working with, um, with having worked with many young people and young people of color, if you're not talking about who you are, no, you know, you're not gonna be trusted. Oh, there's a baby. Um, <laughs> and so um, this idea oh, of- Distracting everybody, sorry. I, I mean, I, yeah, <laughs> like I just wanna now look at the baby. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this idea of like loc locating myself, right? I think there's, especially as a white person, right? I, I don't typically have to walk through the world with as much vulnerability, uh, you know, as, as I imagine a person of color might. And so if I can take the, the, the risk um, to locate myself uh, socioeconomically as a, as a parent or not a parent, um, mm -hmm. as, as a New Yorker or non-New Yorker, right? There's maybe small examples, but they're meaningful because it gives context to who I am and it also puts me in the room as a person and not as a um, not as somebody with sort of this 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 sense of power and and, sure. and control over this other person my client in the room who is also another person and we're two people sitting in a in a room at the end of the day I love that so I'm going to give the audience a chance to ask some questions so if you have a question for any of our panelists or our artists or panelists slash artists slash co-hosts, please drop them into the chat. I live in Harlem, so this is one of the consequences. Uh, so if you can just drop it into a chat, I'd be happy to uh, share any questions that you all have. I'll give you all a moment to think. Um, but I, you know, I want to actually, I did have a question for Alex while we wait, wait for folks. So Alex, I noticed that some of your work is very intense. Um, and really uh, centers around violence, right? Or uh, sort of high, like talking about it, the podcast in particular, or am I misreading that? Tell me a little no, bit no, that's, about, that's right, okay, good. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, sort of like that focus. What is, what is your intent? Um, I, I think the, the intent is, um, there's a friend of mine who's another writer who kind of described it where I think a lot of writers just write about stuff that scares us. And I think that we're all drawn to things um, that frighten us. And that could be, um, you know, something that's happening in your home with, uh, with your partner or spouse. That could be a missing, felt like the missing child story is really ubiquitous because people are terrified of that. And um, I think part of the power of of narrative and fiction is that it mirrors where we are in our lives and we can sometimes it's a cautionary tale um, and sometimes it's just understanding the world around us that when we have the same kind of things in real life we're we know how to cope with them 
Uh, so it's sort of like demystifying um, things that are terrifying. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a lot of it. Okay, great, great. So, it, and then Miguel, um, I was thinking about your work and your work with Fountain House. So, and you're talking about Fountain House, Fountain House, which is downtown. What, how do, how are your fellow Fountain House attendees, how do they react to their work, to your work? To my work, um, they're just very supportive, you know? That's all I can say They, you know, from what I, from what I've seen, they seem to like it, you know? Um, and uh, uh, sometimes people ask me for advice about something like painting, torture, some technical thing or other. You know, I've taught a couple of workshops there. So, um, great, great. So I actually was curious, you know, as we as we kind of think about um, closing our session today, is there something that you're hoping to see? in the intersection with mental health and art in the, over the next year? Because I do feel pretty strongly that there's change coming. There's there is a, a reckoning in a certain way around mental health. And I do think that art is probably the thing that pushes us forward. What are you hoping to see? What are you hoping to do? Well, I agree. I think that art is, is very therapeutic. You know, for me, it, it's life affirming. You know, when I do it, it, uh, I, I feel good, you know, I, I, I feel the presence of God when I'm working and I, and I feel that, you know, when I'm working on sort of um, pushing my ego, pushing myself to the side, then I'm kind of getting closer to a sense of, of God and what God's purpose is for me, which gives me a better relationship with myself um, and then helps me to communicate with other people better, helps my relationships with other people better. So, uh, yeah. you know, there was an artist uh, who was uh, Alexei von Jawlensky, who was a Russian expressionist artist, uh, who said that he felt that uh, art was God made visible. And I, I kind of feel that way. About it. So, Thank so you, Mary. I love that. Yeah. Why don't we start with Chris? What What are you hoping for over the next year? What whole change are you hoping for? Uh, that's a difficult question. Um, I was really intrigued by what, what you said about art and just what I would hope for with that. And, Cause I do think art just plays such a crucial role in how we think about the world and, and mental health in particular. I think, you know, in, when I started Sound Mind, I, I never thought of things in this way, but a lot of what the musicians end up talking about is how when they're on stage, you know, they, they are almost like embodying that wild, crazy person. And that's almost idealized. But then you take that person onto a street and they're treated in a completely different way. And there's an identification that's happening there with the audience. And I think when you use the word kind of reckoning, my mind kind of went there about, you know, art kind of bridging that gap and that divide as we start to realize in this crisis that we're all coping with mental health. We're all needing to be vulnerable because we're all being isolated in new and different ways. And so my hope I think is that art can just continue, continue to be that guiding mechanism. And it also kind of bridges that gap. So that some people can kind of find their own art and their own creativity. Love that. Ian? Same question. Um, you know, I think that for me, what I, what I hope for is that, well, first of all, I mean, as, as an actress, I recognize that I am, you know, making a career out of playing make-believe in front of a camera or in front of a, a group of grown people. And I recognize that there is a certain, you know, there's a certain path that leads one to that decision. And I welcome that path. <laughs> um, but I think that overall, it's, I think that there is a, um, I think there is a celebration to be had in, in, um, in us moving through very difficult and complicated ideas and conversations. You know, I think that we have developed um, a culture and um, a, a system that kind of provides us with sort of this incredibly immediate feedback um, and it can take away a lot of nuance. And so I think that there are a lot of people when we talk about art who are afraid to be complicated and to, um, to make um, bold choices and to make mistakes. And I wanna be clear when I say that I'm not necessarily meaning people in, in, power, in positions of power punching down and then calling it a mistake. What I mean is that like, you know, 
I think that we can sometimes be afraid to show our underbellies, to show our weaknesses, to show, um, or what, what is considered weak, right? Um, and to show those things that are complicated, that are really difficult to talk about, that don't necessarily have clean cut answers. And so I really celebrate storytelling that, um, that tells a story and embraces sort of this idea of a beginning, a middle and an end, um, but also makes that journey a lot more complicated and maybe leaves the end more open-ended than we want to admit or doesn't give us a proper resolution to things. I, I crave stories that leave me just like, no, it can't end like that because the conversation keeps going. And I say this all the time and I'm, you know, facilitating talkbacks, you know, I always say like, you know, once the play is done, the story now belongs to you and you have to carry it on. And so I think that, you know, uh, I look forward to, you know, moving forward as like theater and art and art shifts and changes and adjusts to the times. I hope that we start leaving people with more stories that make them uncomfortable, that make them squirm, that, um, you know, and, and I think that comedy can do that. Joyful things can make us squirm, can make us like think about things or wrestle with things. Like it can be exciting, it can be exhilarating and it doesn't need to be on the backs of um, people who have been historically marginalized. It can happen um, for the empowerment and the benefit of. That's great, thank you. Isabel? Um, I think like most people here and also most people watching, um, I, I can't imagine one person who hasn't either experienced the sensation or heard somebody say that, you know, art saved my life, music saved my life, theater saved my life, um, the arts saved my life, dance saved my life. Um, and that's, that's what got me into the field of creative arts therapies is really like understanding the incredible power of um, transformation that, that art holds. Um, and, and I think that it's also, you know, it, it's, it's, an, it's an obvious and clear um, lane into mental health. Um, you know, it's an opening for people, I think, who might uh, still be either wary or unsure or um, for whatever reason, um, resistant to uh, facing what mental health means um, for them and, and their community and et cetera. So I, I definitely see them intrinsically linked. I'm a little biased, but um, I think that- Yes, that you is, are, but- <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's, an easy, it's an easy opening. So I absolutely think that, um, yeah, including really like more explicitly linking the arts and mental health is um, yeah. we're on the precipice of that, if not already there. And yeah. uh, there's such an opportunity to keep opening those doors. What about you, Alex? Uh, a lot of this is reminding me, so ten, about 10 years ago, I, I was living in New York still, and I was actually working at the Maryland School of Public Health in Columbia. And we were doing a big um, part of the work was with clinical psychologists that uh, were doing work in, in Rwanda. And it was the first time that I was aware of the phenomenon of Rwanda having kind of like a nationwide depression where every year on what they observed as what they still observe as the anniversary of the genocide, the whole country goes into a funk. And I feel like where the world is right now, we're at a point where we, the world and especially where we are in the United States, I feel like a lot of us are kind of mired in that funk right now. And I think that could be hopefully a, a positive in that, um, you know, what we were talking about before is kind of dropping this kind of veneer of formality between people and kind of exposing our vulnerability and who we are. And, and I think there's a difference between recognizing here that people are going through mental health challenges and kind of feeling it in your bones and feeling it here. And I feel like the fact that uh, I believe that suffering breeds empathy. And what I'm hoping is that we're going through a period right now where all of us can recognize that we're all bonded by this weird funk that we're in. And hopefully on the other side of that, we can come out and you, you can kind of feel that in your bones that we're connected, that That's, we don't have now. I love that. I love that connection that we're making. Joelle, you, I'm going to have you and the baby uh, answer it's just me. The baby, I the mean, baby. Uh, you could just put the baby on the screen, and we're, we're no, just. <laughs> oh, 
That's All what right. Wes does. She does this. <laughs> she's bre- she, she, she's getting some some wonderful breast milk right now. Oh, so, great. unfortunately, but <laughs> <laughs> right there. Um, I, I, I think um, th- there are a few things I want to touch on real quick. Like, I think, Isabel, I think when she initially opened and spoke and, and talked about art and the creative practice and how and, and how intrinsic it is to, 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 to not just conversations surrounding mental health, but I think just to the cause. Like, when I think of um, Adrian Marie Brown and, and what she wrote in Pleasure Activism and how she talks about essentially the healing, the, the healing that comes from art, you know, um, there, there, there's an opportunity here for us to, um, and, and it's something I think also like what, what Ian talked about at, at the end of at the end of a play, right? Like we're giving you're you're giving this audience this like it's now up to you. And I love that because it's really what it's talking about is really not it's not a clean ending, right? I think we tend to want as audience as spectators an answer. And I think the best art is really the provocation, and it really allows room for us to have a conversation and ask the hard, messy questions. And I think really what we're talking about is really showing up as human beings. And I think artists and artistry is the, is the best form to do that in. And I'm biased as well, because art did save my life. You know, art kind of helped me move, maneuver through the Bronx, but I think also art allowed me to, to, to be more empathetic because I was paying attention and being aware to whether it be a cast member, whether it be to people in the audience, like how is my work not just affecting me, but affecting the people who are, who are responding to it and recognizing my responsibility mm-hmm. as, a, as a Black artist, really, to carry on the tradition of the ancestors and the storytelling and what that storytelling means for the future mm-hmm. of not just social justice movements, but movements and conversations surrounding the mental health of our community. What you just said made me want to have, I have to say, Ashe. So, <laughs> which I think is a really great way um, to end um, today's uh, service, show, whatever you want to call it. I just want to say thank you so much to the artists and panelists who are gathered here. It has been such a pleasure sharing the virtual stage with you, seeing your work, hearing you talk, and continuing the conversation to remove the stigma and mental health conditions. Um, For the art audience, thank you for joining us. MCC looks forward to engaging in more conversations with you around our programming um, and other important issues. Um, And Ian, I'm going to kick it to you. Uh, as our co-host. Uh, yes, I, just, I, I also want to echo that. Thank you so much to our incredible artists and thank you so much Tia for being an amazing co-host. Thank you to all of the people behind the scenes, Denise, Trisha, Molly, everyone um, at MCC who you don't get to see, but who are you know typing and uh, maneuvering everything uh, so fiercely uh, to make it all happen. Um, so uh, thank you all so much for coming tonight. Thank you for coming to support um, the arts and mental health conversations. It's so crucial and so important. Um, you know, please continue to, uh, MCC look forward to engaging in these more conversations and there's more of our programming to be had. Uh, please continue to check out our, what we're up to page on our MCC website because that's kind of where all the, the good stuff is happening. And then stay tuned for exciting fall programming and have a wonderful, beautiful night. Good night, beautiful people. Bye.